Good afternoon. Well, thank you very much for being here. Today is uh, Friday, and it's a uh, good Friday. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of uh, dedication need to be here for uh, this Friday. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, well, first, well, on behalf of uh, students, faculty, and the community, I would like to uh, thank the Central and uh, Southwest Asia Studies Center for sponsoring this event. And this event is very important, not only for the students, faculty, but also for the community, for education, for the knowledge that we can pass on, and to uh, contribute to the diversity, too. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kia, and also Dr. Adi Kia, uh, uh, for your efforts and for your leadership in organizing the whole event. And uh, this afternoon, uh, we have a group of uh, uh, scholars from uh, Shanghai International Studies University. And uh, we have a little bit changed uh, this afternoon because of uh, the vi visa issue. Uh, there used to be five people coming, and two of them cannot come because of uh, the visa application uh, delay. So we cannot get an early enough uh, time slot for a visa interview. So the uh, cannot come. So we only have uh, three uh, professors instead of uh, five. So I will introduce uh, each of them to you in uh, just a minute. And l let me first uh, uh, introduce a little bit the relationship that UM has with uh, Shanghai International Studies University. Well, it's about eight or nine years ago when Dr. Meredith Kia and myself went to China for a trip. And we uh, set up lots of uh, China-related programs, and we went through uh, a few cities, and Shanghai is one of them. And uh, we visited Sisu, and we uh, had a special meeting with uh, the Sisu Middle East Research Institute. And from then on, we established a formal relationship. That, w that happened, I think, in uh, 19, uh, uh, 2011. So ever since then, where well, they has been, have been sending delegations to our conference. So this is uh, the 17th uh, conference for UM, and uh, this is their eight times to be here. So half of the time where well, they have been here, and I'm sure they will continue to be here. And uh, their institute is one of the best in the nation. So as I said last night, it's part of uh, the government think tank uh, in China, so they provide the top leaders of uh, the Chinese government with the uh, information and current events and for them to make their decision based on. So uh, it's very important that institute plays a very, very uh, important role in uh, not only the academia field, but also in uh, politics and also national security and so on and so forth. And uh, that institute has uh, two nationwide well-known magazines and from a fourth year, fourth year ago, and uh, they appointed Dr. Kia Meredad as the member of the editorial board. And it's a great honor, not only for himself as a person, but also for the university as a whole. So, yeah, congratulations. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> and as I mentioned, that well, uh, that university is a highly ranked university in the nation. And it's a very prestige, and uh, they have uh, trained a lot of uh, qualified students, and we have a very, very well-known and uh, important alumni uh, uh, from that university. And we have uh, one former first lady in China uh, who graduated from uh, our university, and uh, uh, two foreign ministers, uh, three dozen uh, ambassadors to different countries in the world, and, uh, and the current Chinese uh, ambassador to China actually graduated from uh, Sisu. And uh, so we have a very strong and uh, long time uh, relationship with the university. A lot of people here have visited Sisu, including Effie, when she was uh, the director of uh, uh, foreign students and scholar services. And whenever I w go back, and they always ask me uh, to say hello to uh, Effie uh, because of her help and constant support 
Well, thank you very much, Effie. Yeah. Well, here I, I want to uh, recognize a very one special person. Uh, when I first came here, I, uh, I'm always a curious person, so I was on my bike a lot, traveling in the city and visiting all kinds of different places. And then all of a sudden I saw Christian Science Monitor, uh, reading room. Christian Science Monitor has been one of uh, the very few Western newspapers in China, which uh, Chinese government says, okay, that's a great newspaper because of its objectivity. And uh, so when I, w when I was a young student, as you guys, at, uh, uh, as an undergraduate student, well, I read a lot from uh, Christian Science Monitor, that newspaper, I learned a lot. And so I saw this, so I walked in, and then I met with uh, Mrs. Jean Morrison. And we became friends right away, and uh, developed a very fine relationship. And later on, we mutually adopted each other. I adopted her as my mom, and she adopted me as her son. And in 1996, I took her and her, her husband to Shanghai and had a very nice visit. And she stayed with my family for two weeks where you went in uh, 2011. Yeah, yeah they visited uh, uh, the high school and the park, as you did. Yeah, yeah so we had a very uh, wonderful experience over there. And at that time, well, my mom was in her deathbed. So she said, well, thank you very much for taking care of my son. And from now on, probably I had to transfer my motherhood to you. So you had to take care of him, yeah. Well, if he has a problem, you just give him a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since then, I have been taking groups after groups after groups of uh, Chinese people to Plains, Montana for visits to get to know the uh, grassroots culture of uh, the American uh, 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 country, uh, the, the U.S., and we visited were schools, hospitals, and uh, the, the people and ranches, and we had nice talks, and uh, so that people will have uh, good chances to know what's going on at grassroots level of our culture. And as a matter of fact, well, three days ago, I took this group to there, too, for a very nice visit. We spent one whole day over there. And they believe that's just wonderful. So thank you for doing this for the last 30 years. Thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time and efforts to drive all the way here from uh, Plains, Montana to meet with us. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> There are probably a hundred groups, some of them. Actually, uh, Professor Bu was one of the groups. That's uh, 12, 15 years ago, right? Yeah, that's, that's a long time. 10 years ago? OK. Well, anyway, let's get to our business. <laughs> yeah, I would like to uh, introduce uh, these uh, uh, three scholars who are to you. On my left is uh, Professor Zhao Jun. And he, was a pro he is a professor at the Shanghai International Studies University. And we were fortunate to have him here last year for one whole year as a visiting scholar. And uh, uh, he, was, uh, he is an associate professor over there. And he is also the director of uh, the Center for North African Studies. So there is an institute. It's called Middle East Research Institute. And under that institute, there are a few uh, centers. So he is uh, the head of uh, the North African Centers. And he has published uh, quite a few uh, artic uh, articles. And well, last year, well, actually this year, early this year, he just published one book. When he wrote this book when he was here. And he had a lot of uh, mentoring from uh, Dr. Mary Dakia. So your name is the first one in, uh, on that page of a, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. And today's uh, topic for him is uh, China's participation in Egypt's port construction, opportunities, risks, and its evaluation. Uh, that is going to be his uh, uh, topic. 
And next to him is uh, Professor Chen, uh, Chen Xuanming. And he is not new to us either. Well, this is his uh, third trip here. And uh, he is uh, the director of another session under that institute. And that section is focused on energy media studies program. Right? And he is uh, the director. And welcome again. Yeah, welcome. And another thing I want to mention about him is that well, he came here well, during his honeymoon. So he is still well, in his uh, honeymoon. He just got married. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. And his topic today is BRI. What is BRI? Uh, oh, okay, so it's a Belt, belt and a Road Initiative and in China and the Middle East M Median Exchange, and that will be uh, his uh, topic. And then to the further left is uh, Professor uh, Mu, uh, Mu Chunhuan. And Chunhuan means a spring awakening. That's a very good name. <laughs> and thank you for uh, coming here to awake the spring in Missoula. <laughs> So for the wonderful weather for the last few days, and hope the weather will continue. And she is a professor over there, and then she uh, uh, decided to apply for a doctoral degree uh, program. So right now she's officially on a doctoral program uh, with the university. And currently she is visiting uh, uh, Denver University as a visiting uh, professor, just like a Professor Zhao did with us a year ago. And today's uh, uh, topic for her is uh, the characteristics of a cross-border ethnicity and the develop development of a Syria Kurdish movement. And that will be uh, her topic. So today's, uh, to uh, today's speech will be conducted just according to that order uh, from uh, Professor Zhao. And please hold off the questions. And we will have a question and answer session right after all these uh, three uh, speeches. Uh, let's give a hand to Professor Tsao. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor <coughs> to stand here to make a speech to you. And uh, this is my uh, the latest, uh, latest research, research is, uh, about Chinese, uh, China policy on Egypt. So my topic is uh, <coughs> Chinese participation in Egypt's port construction, current uh, situation, opportunities, uh, and uh, risks. What's Chinese policy uh, on uh, Egypt? So today I will share <coughs> my opinions about uh, uh, such a topic. As we know, the location of Egypt makes it a key juncture of the silk Zood economic belt and the 21st century maritime silk Zood. So the importance. So the importance of Egyptian Egypt's Zood in China promotion of the belt and Zood initiative shall not be underestimated. Currently, port construction in Egypt is merging as a new investment in a hot spot of Chinese enterprises. Therefore, how to seize the opportunities to effectively invest in Egypt's port construction while avoiding risks, risks is a meaningful topic. And today, I will uh, share four parts uh, in the topic. One, I'll give you a brief introduction about uh, <coughs> Egypt's 
port construction and uh, uh, maritime transportation. And uh, part two, I will uh, tell you what kind of uh, situation China's uh, participation, uh, China's uh, current participation and uh, in Egyptian port construction. Part three, I will analyze uh, the opportunities and risks when China <coughs> uh, participate in uh, Egypt's uh, port construction. And the last, I will give some suggestions, maybe on our government. Uh, now let's uh, turn to the first part of one. And here I will give you a brief introduction of the uh, basic features of uh, Egypt's port construction and uh, maritime trans uh, transportation. As we know, to ancient Egyptians, the Nile was uh, the life blood that formed a well-developed network of water routes. And thus, port construction became an essential part of people's life and uh, production. Uh, with the arrival of uh, Mediterranean era, the water transportation and uh, port construction in uh, Egypt entered uh, a new phase of uh, marine shipping which was marked by the completion of the port, uh, the land drill. Land drill. It meant the coexistence of Nile system and the marine system at the time. In recent times, the historic operation of the Suez Canal and Aswan Dam have joined the Nile with the Red Sea and the Man Ma Mediterranean Sea, which has formed the framework for today's convenient roadway transportation in Egypt, and laid a solid foundation for the sustainable development of uh, its port construction. Uh, you can see the, <coughs> the map of uh, today's um, water system, uh, water transportation system in Egypt. Uh, according to the uh, historic uh, uh, water transportation in uh, Egypt, I think uh, uh, at the moment uh, there are four distinctive features in Egypt's port construction and maritime transportation. Firstly, Egypt's port construction and uh, marine transportation is a wide part of the international shipping system. The country's 2,500 kilometer coastline enable it to rank among the countries with the most ports in the world and turn it into one of the major international uh, logistic centers. Egypt, Egypt's uh, port in infrastructure rank 41 among 137 countries and regions. Secondly, maritime transportation is an important uh, backbone in the twin Egypt that plays a key role in the development of national economy and exerts profound influence on other industries such as tourism and trade. Thirdly, Egypt's port construction prepare its domestic economy and international interaction. The construction and the development of the ports considerably advances the process of Egypt's globalization and marketization and strengthens the ties between Egypt and other countries, bring more opportunities of economic and trade cooperation. At the same time, the advantages geographical location of Egypt and its well-developed ports have made it a key passage for maritime transportation between the countries surrounding the Med Mediterranean Sea and Asian countries. Besides, 
export of goods heavily relies on the capacity of port transportation. Therefore, port construction and development can also drive the construction of infrastructures like railways, roads, and so forth, prepare the development of logistics, and strengthen the in inter in interaction between Egypt's domestic economy and global market. Thirdly, all the infrastructures of the ports have been constantly advanced. The capacity for ocean shipping still needs upgrading. In recent years, we have witnessed continuous progress in Egypt's port annual holding capacity. But uh, it's a pity that the number of uh, the registered vessels owned by Egyptian company has climbed from 132 uh, to 151, but uh, most have uh, failed to use uh, in the global economy. And uh, after the brief introduction of uh, the basic features uh, of uh, Egypt's uh, <coughs> port construction and maritime transportation, and let's uh, uh, turn to the part two. China's uh, current uh, participation and uh, its significance. And uh, a lot of people uh, failed to notice uh, uh, China's investment in uh, Egyptian, uh, Egypt uh, Port construction, uh, but uh, after a Belt and Road Initiative, uh, there are a lot of uh, investment. Uh, <coughs> Chinese investment uh, in Egypt uh, port construction. Now, let me introduce uh, uh, a summary to you. Uh, as we know, Egypt is the first country in Africa, and also the first. Uh, among Arab countries uh, to establish diplomatic uh, ties with China. For long term, China and uh, Egypt have maintained friendly political and uh, economic uh, relations. But it is quite recently that Chinese enterprises uh, have obtained contracts and directly participated in seaport construction mm -hmm. in Egypt. Uh, this is uh, this is the first uh, and uh, the most important uh, China, China, Chinese company uh, investment in uh, Egyptian port construction. You can see uh, from uh, the time to time, and the last uh, until in March uh, twenty fifteen, China uh, Harbor participated uh, in the extension project of uh, Suhana Port and Port uh, Damita as the main contractor and operator, uh, which was a major breakthrough in Chinese uh, enterprises participation in Egypt's port uh, construction until now. And uh, in general, China's direct investments in Egypt's aid Egypt's uh, port construction are still limited, and the Chinese uh, enterprises uh, participation is confined to service projects and uh, support uh, uh, facility construction, which means China's participation in Egypt's port construction is, in terms of both investment scale and value, still on the initial uh, stage. Nevertheless, the participation is a greater uh, significance. Uh, it uh, con concludes uh, uh, two aspects. Uh, first, in the site of uh, Egypt, I think uh, uh, <coughs> China's uh, uh, participation in port construction at least cover the following three aspects. First it can help relieve the money crunch to a certain extent. Second, it can produce the 
merits our scale economy. Third, it can help realize Egypt's strategic target of balancing great powers. And second, as a second uh, from China's point of view, I think uh, uh, it close, uh, includes uh, the following. Uh, China's participation Egypt's uh, port construction uh, bears uh, substantial significance. One, it uh, contributes to the construction of a 21st century maritime silk route whose success heavily relies on the development of key ports on the route. On the other hand, China's investment and uh, participation in Egypt's uh, port construction set a foundation for two countries further political and economic uh, cooperation. And last, port construction and development uh, is a long-term source of uh, economic growth uh, for Egypt. Therefore, Chinese, uh, China's active participation in the area has a great practical significance to e Egypt government. Uh, this is uh, our government's uh, view. Now, uh, I'll give you uh, some opinions. Uh, uh, China's uh, uh, participation in <coughs> Egyptian port construction, uh, its uh, opportunities and uh, challenges. By now, Egypt has uh, been one of the most uh, supportive countries of uh, Belt and, Be uh, Belt and uh, the uh, initiative, which is believed to be a great opportunity for Egypt's uh, growth in the international uh, community. Therefore, the CC government has been making a positive effort to promote the program cooperation with China. Uh, you can see such a, a policy uh, from the both sides. However, due to the special <coughs> strategic uh, location of uh, Egypt and the political sensitivity of the port construction participation, which may be interpreted uh, as an attempt to control Suez uh, Canal, China should be fully uh, aware of the potential risks involved and uh, make sensible decisions. Uh, first side, uh, risks. I here uh, listed uh, the risks. risks. Uh, you can can uh, read uh, the blanket. First, geopolitical risks uh, should be taken into consideration. Uh, it's about uh, the uh, confrontation between uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran, uh, Palestine issues uh, and uh, IS, the terror, terrorist uh, organization, a nuclear issue of Iran, uh, uh, Syria, Syria problem, Iraq problem, Libyan problem, and uh, Yemen uh, crisis as well. Second, uh, economic risks uh, including as uh, Egypt uh, physic physical policy, free policy and uh, loose monetary policy. Uh, especially uh, uh, Egypt receives uh, substantial financi financial aids uh, from GG GCC and uh, IMF. On the other hand, uh, economic risk, risks uh, refers uh, in refers to the commercial environment. Third, there's also a uh, doing business uh, environment. Uh, investment risk, risks caused by the problems of uh, policy insistence, uh, inconsistency, uh, fluctu fluctuation of exchange rates.
What's more, China's pa participation in port construction has to face security risks, including social unrest and terrorism in uh, e Egypt. Moreover, there are legal risks out, out of the corruption of uh, judiciary and uh, the imperfection of uh, legal system uh, resulted uh, from uh, political chaos. After the establishment of uh, CC's government, uh, Egypt has passed a series of law relating to the investment. Uh, you can see the list. Uh, the last one, I will, uh, last part, I will give uh, some uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, some re recommendations have been adopted by our government. <coughs> here I list uh, uh, the suggestions here. We shall grab the present uh, strategic opportunity as China ha has uh, at least two advantages over other countries at the moment. Uh, one, one is a mutual trust shared by China and Egypt, contrasted with uh, uncertainty character characterizing Egypt's uh, relations with America and uh, Russia. <coughs> the other is a fact that uh, China is the largest trade partner of uh, Egypt at present, and uh, its direct uh, investment in the country is continuously mounting. This is a fact. Uh, though China's, uh, Chinese investment in uh, Egypt is very, very small, constructed to the uh, EU countries. Uh, suggesting two, a uh, visual make for preparation includes <coughs> at least uh, the following three. Uh, in the first place, apart from the reminding investors of the possible risks, uh, our powerful departments need to publicize the latest, latest news about Chinese investments in Egypt, helping Chinese investors make right decisions and clearing their unnecessary doubts and concerns. And this is our government now doing such a, doing such a business. Second, China investments in Egypt shall not be confined to the construction of a port itself, as port construction is a systematic uh, program. Uh, and today, our government, uh, uh, the, the investment of a government uh, in Egypt uh, have done a systematic, uh, systematic uh, tasks and uh, investment in Egypt. Thirdly, Chinese investors shall make full use of the preferential measures and simplified procedures according to the new investment law of Egypt. And the investment priorities shall be given to the areas and the industries supported by Egyptian government. Um, thank you all. said that we will hold off all the questions until the end of uh, all the presentations. And the next speaker will be uh, Professor Xu, and he's going to talk about the median exchange between China and also Middle East countries, where there has been lots of going on between these two areas, China and that area, and lots of investment and construction. And then well, we believe that there should be uh, also cooperation in media to reflect that relationship and also to create images in these two areas about each other, positive images. And that's what Chinese government has been struck really hard for. Yeah, we need to have uh, positive images. Thank you very much.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is my privilege to be here, uh, to present here. Uh, firstly, special thanks to Dr. Kier, Dr. Tao, for their special contributor to the uh, 17th Annual International Conference on Central and uh, Southwest Asia. Uh, the conference witnesses the cooperation between our institutes and uh, the Central and the Southwest Asia Study Center. I, which is, I think the conference will be better and better in the future. The topic of my presentation is the uh, One Belt, One Road Initiative and the Middle East uh, Media Exchange. Uh, my presentation is divided into four parts. Uh, the first part is about uh, the introduction, and the second about uh, the China's achievement in uh, media exchanges with the Mid Middle East countries. The third part is the problem existing in the media exchange between China and the uh, Middle East countries. And finally, the conclusion. Now let's move uh, the introduction. The Belt uh, and the Road Initiative is a uh, road of peaceful cooperation uh, openness, tolerance, mutual learning, and the mutual benefits. The proposal of the Belt and the Road Initiative has a broad historic opportunities for the media exchange between China and the Middle East. It has also put forward higher requirements for media cooperation between the two sides. Uh, China's achievement in media exchange with the Middle East countries. The media exchanges between China and Middle East countries can be checked back into 1950s. In 1955, uh, at an invitation of the China's uh, Journalist Association, a delegation from, of six people from each Egyptian news agency visited China and was uh, cordially received by then Premier Zhong Lai in December 1956. A delegation of Chinese journalists uh, arrived uh, in Cairo to uh, implement the China-Egypt uh, Cultural Cooperation Agreement of 1956. And to visit Egypt, uh, they were met uh, by Ahmed uh, Hassan uh, Bakri, at that time Minister of Religious Fund of Egypt, and uh, Mustafa uh, Yusuf and then Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt. Since then, the journalists and the news delegations, as well as the officials of the government, press department, and the news leaders of political parties from uh, Algeria, Somalia, Sudan, Morocco, Tunisia, and other Arabic countries, and the regions have successfully visited China. In October 1981, a delegation of Chinese journalists uh, arrived in uh, uh, Megadisu, the capital of uh, Somalia, and uh, began a four-day visit to Somalia. The delegation was received by President Said. In March 1992, at the invitation of the Egyptian press and uh, Ahalan, a delegation of uh, China People Daily, headed by then the chief editor, Shao Hu Zhe arrived at the Cairo uh, for a friendly visit to Egypt. Egyptian Information Minister Sarif met with uh, Saud Hu Zhe and his delegation in Cairo. Since the beginning of the new century, the friendly and cooperative relations between China and the Middle East countries have made new progress. In September 2004, China and Arab countries signed the Declaration of China Arab State Cooperation Forum. On the same day, China and Arab countries also signed the action plan of the China Arab State Cooperation Forum. Since then, media exchange and the cooperation between China and Arab countries have begun to be carried out with many for forms, channels, and uh, levels. The scale and the uh, frequency of the change are greater and richer than before. Uh, the media change between China and the Middle East uh, covers all aspects 
related to it, including the exchange between government news departments, as well as the digital radio, television stations, and the print media on both sides. Almost all the central media and the news organizations in China have various exchanges and cooperations with the media of the Middle East countries, includes People Daily, Xinhua News Agency, CCTV, China Radio International, and China Association of Journalists. Some Chinese media have also established regular exchanges and cooperation mechanisms with the Middle East media in terms of the radio and television media exchange. The Arabic language channels of the China Radio International, which started in 1957, broadcast 22 hours a day and is widely welcomed by listeners in the Middle East countries. Two, the content of uh, communication is uh, more abundant. Uh, first, the number of branch officials and the press uh, stations is uh, increasing. Uh, China's Xinhua News Agency has uh, branches in uh, uh, 14 Middle East countries and their regions. The People's Daily has uh, branches in Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, and uh, Sudan. Uh, China Radio International have a journalist station in Egypt and uh, Qatar, respectively. Uh, following the establishment of uh, Egyptian Middle East News Agency in Beijing branch, Qatar Peninsula Television in 2002 and uh, Morocco News Agency in 2005 also set up branches in Beijing. Uh, two, the sharing of news resources and personnel cooperation had be been further strengthened. Three, there are various forms of communication such as uh, seminars and training courses. Three, the uh, internet and uh, new media exchanges are uh, flourishing. In May 2002, the Arabic website of China Radio International was officially launched. China's mainstream official media have uh, launched their own Arabic online editors, such as the Arabic versions of China Radio International, the Arabic versions of China Central Television Network, People Daily Com, and Xinhua Com. The Arabic uh, online editions of these media has also opened an interactive space for Arabic readers and has uh, achieved initial results. For example, uh, Xinhua Arabic language channels has opened official accounts on social media Twitter. The Arabic uh, language versions uh, of uh, China com and Arabic language versions of China radio com also open official accounts on the social media such as uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook. Uh, Xinhua News Agency has also tailored uh, mobile news media produced uh, with uh, completely independent intellectual property rights for users in the uh, UAE the mobile phone APP of Xinhua in the United Arab uh, Emirates, which is the uh, only Chinese Arab bilingual news information and uh, services information APP. Four, continuous improvement of media communication mechanisms. In September 2004, China and Arabic countries signed the delegation of the China Arabic State Cooperation Forum. On the same day, China and Arabic countries also signed the Plan of Action of the China Arabic State Cooperation Forum. The Plan of Action carries out news cooperation through bilateral and multilateral channels and encourages major news media of both sides to strengthen its changes. In 2011, the first China Arabic Radio and Television Cooperation Forum was held in uh, Ningxia, and uh, it was held every two years through this forum. The bilateral and the multilateral exchanges and the cooperation mechanism of China Arabic radios and television media will be more mature and uh, complete. In addition, several of the Middle East countries are African countries, and uh, most of them are members of China Africa Cooperation Forum. Therefore, these countries belong to both the Middle East and uh, Africa, 
and the immediate change and cooperation can be carried out within the framework of China Arabic States Cooperation Forum and the China Africa Cooperation Forum. Number two, problems existing in the media the changes between China and the Middle East countries. Although the coverage rate of Chinese media in the world is almost the same as that of uh, Western countries, there are big gap between China media and the Western media in terms of the international audience, uh, content rates, residence rates, audience rates, and listening rates. The work of the media has not substantially improved China's international credibility and international public opinion leadership. This led to China's lack of uh, discourse power in the Arabic world, which is not a common uh, commensurate with the national strength. Uh, institutional and uh, mechanical aspects. Uh, in 2008, the first China Arab News Cooperation Forum was held in Beijing. The two sides signed their uh, memorandum uh, memor 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 of understanding on the fr friendly news cooperation and the changes between China and the member states of the League Arab States, which marks the exchange between China and the Arabic countries. After 10 years of development, Great progress had been made in the media exchange between China and Arabic countries. But there are still some problems, such as the time lagging, lack of uh, coordinating, and lack of uh, attention, especially in terms of uh, frequency level and the scale of exchange, media exchange between China and Arabic countries lag behind exchange and cooperation in other fields. There is a lack of uh, coordination in news work especially in major international news and important events involving bilateral relations, and the lack of cooperation, reporting, and uh, coordinating response. News communication has not yet received enough attention. In sense of diplomacy, uh, mainstream Chinese media in Middle East countries lack of a sense of uh, overall situation. Uh, subject and uh, means there are not many non-government media engaged in uh, relevant work and uh, without policy encouragement and uh, guidance the self-media is too scattered and present to the Arabic world a more colorful China which is different from official promotion. It is also difficult for China to effectively promote private exchange between the two sides in terms of means of communication, the corresponding measures of the Chinese media are limited to open accounts in international social media, but these measures are only forms, and the further efforts are needed to expand the influence of content and innovation work methods. Uh, public opinion environment. The United States, Russia, Britain, France and other Western countries have their own interest and uh, strategic planning in the Middle East region for a long time. In addition, the development countries are in the traditional domain position in international politics. Their media have developed uh, maturely, maturely, maturely in the Middle East region and uh, become powerful to the local media. In terms of talent uh, reserve, China still lack of professional who are familiar with Middle East languages, culture, national conditions, and international relations. Thailand's training is also an important basis for promoting the long-term development of media exchanges between China and Arab countries. Now, last one, conclusion. Under the context of a Belt Road Initiative, China should improve the existing communication and activities on the Silk Road. First, to form an orderly, efficient, and unique internal communication mechanisms and expand their pro popularity and the influence of mainstream Chinese media in the Middle East countries. Second, the Chinese journalists should actively go to the front line of the work in the Arabic world so as to realize the direct exchange and the cooperation between Chinese media and Arabic media. 
They should tell Chinese stories well and innovate in the national communication arts and the techniques in a way that is acceptable to every audience. Thirdly, it is to grab the, the cultural context and the use of uh, uh, polysemous discourse to uh, disseminate appropriate content. In addition, the media exchanges between China and the Middle East countries should also include religious considerations and a humanistic care so as to express opinion in a way closer to people's heart. Thank you for your patient listening. Well, thank you very much, Professor Chin, for your talk. And uh, next, we welcome uh, Ms. Uh, Mu to give us a talk on her view on the Kurdish movement and also the Chinese standpoint, government's point on Kurdish movement. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ke Dr. Kea. Thank you, Professor Zhao. Uh, uh, thank you to help me today. And uh, I'd like to talk uh, the characteristic of cross-border ethnic uh, eth uh, ethnicity and the development of uh, Syria Kurdish movement. Um, as we know, the Kurds is the fourth largest uh, uh, ethnic. Sorry. Uh, as we know, the Kurds is the fourth largest uh, ethnic group in the Middle East with a population of about 30 or 35 million and mainly inhabiting in the Kurdistan. In the first half of the uh, of, uh, 20th century, with the successive establishment of Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and uh, Syria, Kurdistan was divided into four parts by the countries mentioned above, which caused the Kurds lost uh, their opportunity to create their mm, uh, independent uh, nation and became um, ethnic uh, minorities in these countries. Since the Kurds couldn't re uh, realize their national rights in these host countries, uh, even their ethnic uh, identities were uh, not uh, recognized and basic civil rights couldn't be guaranteed. The Kurds had been struggling uh, several decades. Uh, although all of the Kurds are fighting for the one nation uh, identity, but uh, the Kurdish uh, parties from different uh, countries organized uh, movements uh, separately. Uh, and uh, they have uh, hardly considered fighting for a, a unified Kurdish nation, uh, nation state as a common goal, except the PKK once did it in a certain period. Uh, from this page, we can uh, see the development of the uh, Kurdish movements in different countries. In Turkey, uh, Kurdish rebellions, 1925-1930s, uh, 1937, and the armed uh, insurgency of the PKK from the 1980s uh, until today. Iran establishment of the Republic of Mahabad in 1946 with the support of uh, Soviet Union, but only last one year. Uh, uh, Iraq, two wars against uh, Baghdad uh, regime during the 1960s and 1970s uh, established a de facto uh, autonomy in uh, 1992 after the Gulf War. 
and uh, the KRG, the Kurdish, Kurdistan Regional Government, gained uh, uh, legitimacy after the Iraq war. And uh, uh, Syria, as we know, gaining de facto uh, autonomy in the north and the north uh, northeast of Syria from 2012. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the Kurds is a typical cross-border ethnic. Uh, and uh, um, as a uh, cross-border ethnic groups, the Kurds had many characteristics. First, uh, the Kurds are maintaining deeply cultural and uh, psychological ties. The borders of the sovereign states didn't cut off their common national identity, and uh, they share the common identity of Kurds, language, culture, uh, history, customs, and uh, uh, they live in the land of Kurdistan. And these relations create a deep uh, psychological bond among the Kurds and cause that Kurds in each country are very concerned about the fate of Kurds in other countries. Uh, the Kurds' misfortunes in one country will draw sympathy from the Kurds in the other countries. Likewise, the prog uh, progress of the Kurds national movement in one country can encourage other Kurds around. Secondly, inhabiting uh, a contiguous area facilitates cross-border interaction of the Kurds. Uh, Kurds in all four countries live in adjacent border areas, which makes it easier for them to move about uh, with each other. Third, some Kurdish parties would like to expand their influence to the neighboring Kurdish party uh, regions. Due to oppression of the sovereign uh, states, the Kurds parties are in difficult environment in their host countries. The neighboring Kurdish areas are strategic choices, uh, choice uh, for them uh, to seek uh, refugee to preserve their strengths and to mobilize the Kurds there. And on the other hand, the powerful Kurdish parties also attempt to extend their influence beyond the borders. Uh, these characters of the cross-border ethnicity results in the spillover effects of the Kurdish movements. The development of the Kurdish movement in one country probably influenced the movements in the other country. And uh, uh, the types of the spillover uh, spill effects in Kurdish movements uh, include four types. Uh, first is uh, mobilization aspect. Here, it mainly refers to the uh, contagion of nationalism sentiment. It means that the greater progress of Kurdish moment in one country will inspire the Kurds in the other countries. This uh, phenomenon was caused by the common national identity. Organizational, organization aspect, it means uh, uh, it refers to the impact on the uh, establishment and development of Kurdish organization and uh, parties. Uh, ideology aspect, the theoretical basis for the aims, methods of the uh, Kurdish moment, it means. Uh, activity aspect, it means the impact on the specific process of the development of the Kurdish moment. And the Syria Kurdish moment has been obviously experiencing the spillover effects of the neighboring Kurdish moments, especially the Iraqi Kurdish moments and PKKs. And why the Syria Kurdish moment is deeply affected by, by the spillover effects of neighboring Kurdish moments? Uh, there are three reasons. First, uh, Syria Kurdish moment developed uh, relatively late, and it once lagged behind for a long time. The first uh, Syria Kurdish 
uh, party established in 1970, uh, 1957. From then on, many Kurdish parties was, uh, were created. However, they were quite small and uh, powerless and hardly uh, organized uh, any uh, campaigns effectively before Syria civil war. While uh, Iraqi Kurdish parts and, uh, parties and the Kurdish Workers' Party in Turkey had, have been struggling for their national and democratic rights for decades, also have accumulated uh, rich experience and strong uh, strength. The, uh, strength, sorry. Uh, the Syria uh, second, the Syria regime opened its boundaries to Iraqi Kurdish parties and PKK from 1970s until the end of last century, which facilitated the PK, PKK and the and the Iraqi Kurdish parties' impact on Syria Kurdish movement directly. Uh, in order to against the neighbors, also transfer its Kurdish problem and contain its Kurds, the Syria government used to allow Iraqi and the Turkish Kurdish parties operate in Syria. These Kurdish parties were uh, once active in Syria for many years. Uh, the th th third, the outbreak of Syria civil war is a sudden historical opportunity for Syria Kurdish movement, uh, movement and both uh, both uh, Kurdish Kurdistan regional government and the PKK attempted to exert their influence on the movement. In addition, to make the most of opportunity, uh, Syria Kurds needs more help from the neighboring Kurds. So it is inevitable for the Syria Kurdish movement to be mainly uh, influenced by Iraqi Kurdish parties and the PKK. And the way of the spillover effect of the neighboring Kurdish movement's in impact on the Syria Kurdish movement, um, I think there are two ways, intentional infiltration and the unintentional uh, unintentional ways. Uh, for the the uh, intentional infiltration, uh, it means the neighboring Kurdish parties deliberately and uh, purposefully influence the Syria Kurdish movement. Movement in great extent, Iraqi Kurdish parties and PKK try to make the Syria Kurdish movement to the extension of their own movements. Uh, uh, organization infiltration. Uh, both Iraqi Kurd Kurdish parties and the PKK have the Syria Kurds fund parties. The Kurdish uh, Democratic Par Party in Syria, which is the first Kurdish party in Syria, was founded with the help of Iraqi Kurdish Democratic Party. Uh, well, the Kurdish Democratic Union Party PYD, which is the leader party of the autonomy of Kurds in Syria today, was found with the support of PKK. In this process, they built up influence in Syria Kurdish area. And the ideology infiltration, the sort of construction in Rojava, uh, autonomy origin, originates from the democratic Confederation, uh, confederalism of uh, Algerlan, uh, the leader of PKK. At the same time, the KRG, also uh, the Kurdish regional government, also tried to export its uh, autonomy model to Kurdish autonomy in Syria, the role of the Kurdish National Council. And the activity infiltration Especially after the outbreak of civil uh, Syria civil war, the neighboring Kurdish parties support Syria Kurds organizationally and uh, militarily. And uh, uh, an intentional uh, involvement uh, includes uh, con uh, cont contagion of nationalist sentiment. For instance, 
the development of Iraqi Kurdish movement during the Iraq Iraqi war in 2003 provided an important psychological boost to the Kurds, mobilized and encouraged the, the Syria Kurds. Uh, also, the export, uh, export of parties uh, contradiction. The conflict between Iraqi Kurdish parties, uh, KDP and uh, KU, uh, PUK, Kurdi, Kurdistan Democratic Party, and the uh, Patriotic Union of Kurdistan uh, had, left, had led to the uh, formation of different uh, factions in Syria Kurdish parties, which uh, exacerbated their uh, contradiction and uh, uh, sub uh, sub uh, sub of Syria Kurdish parties. And the results of these uh, effects are both positive and negative. Uh, the positive uh, effect means promote the rise of Kurdish movement. And the negative spillover effect means impede the Kurdish movement. Uh, conclusion, as a cross-border ethnic group, uh, Kurdish movements generate uh, spillover effects uh, universally. Due to the specific conditions and uh, environment, the spillover effects of the neighboring Kurdish movements impact on Syria Kurdish movement obviously. The effects are both intentional and unintentional, and the results of the uh, effects are both positive and negative. Thank you. Now the session is open for questions. And uh, please raise your hand. We have a microphone here. Uh, please keep the question short and target it to one of uh, the speakers. Testing. I'm just uh, curious if you can tell us a little bit more about the, the nature of the trade between Egypt and China. What sort of products are these two countries exchanging? Uh, the trade between uh, China and uh, Egypt uh, is mainly as you refer to Chin Chinese ex uh, export. Most uh, <coughs> most of the Chinese foods, uh, most of the Chinese items uh, is uh, exported to uh, Egypt, Egypt, and uh, China has imp uh, import little from uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, a lot of light uh, industrial uh, products uh, is ex exported to Egypt from China. Thank you. So then the economic influence is, is skewed, the balance is skewed. It sounds like China exports a lot to Egypt, and Egypt not so much to China. Uh, last year, uh, the, tra the volume of trade uh, uh, between Egypt and uh, China is uh, over um, one thousand uh, million dollars, but uh, China has has ex exported uh, about uh, ninety and uh, ninety thousand uh, million products to uh, Egypt. So uh, it's a very large trade deficit. Uh, for the e Egypt. Yeah. Um, do you see that the Egypt-China trade relationship might at some point be viable on a, on a more equitable basis um, down the road? 
in your presentation, it, it sounded like um, they're working on some trade agreements, international agreements, and and uh, rules of conduct um, to to be on the play on the same page. Um, so I'm just wondering. That sounds to me like uh, you're anticipating, or your um, your your presentation gave me the impression that perhaps at some point. China and Egypt would have very strong trade relations relative to, say, Russia and the United States, mm. European Union. Is that, was that a... Uh, I, I think uh, mm, China, and, uh, the relation between China and Egypt uh, very strong in economy, e economy mm. and uh, political. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. but not uh, uh, security mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not a place we would want to invest in anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I think never, <laughs> never unbalanced uh, between uh, the two countries because uh, Egypt has a. Uh, has little products uh, uh, which China need. This is a fact. And, and uh, Egypt uh, need, uh, should uh, get uh, a lot of products from China or from, uh, uh, from China, especially technical and uh, uh, light industrial products. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, light uh, industrial products uh, uh, that uh, Egypt can't uh, um, pr produce uh, itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. I was just uh, wondering about tourism. A lot of Chinese tourists come to Egypt would that be one of the export items, you know, of uh, Egypt? In other words, by attracting more tourists from China, that helps the economy, right, of the country? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Is there a lot of promotion of tourism? Yes. Uh, uh, these days, a lot of uh, Chinese travel in Egypt. And last year, the uh, Egyptian official number is uh, about uh, 21 at uh, sorry uh, two two hundred uh, two hundred thousand Chinese uh, uh, went to uh, Egypt two hundred yeah 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 Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So the first question on the Kurds. Uh, <laughs> um, so how would I put it? Uh, China has, uh, at least in appearance, has this soft diplomacy. You know, all your three uh, uh, presentations, uh, basically you de-emphasize military involvement, you emphasize trade, exchanges, media, and so on and so forth. So the strategy of China seems to be uh, promoting uh, good relationships, basically, and by influence, by providing Egypt with basic material goods and so on and so forth, and compete with Russia and United States at the same time for the same markets. Uh, so even in the case of Syria, for example, uh, China refuses to condemn uh, the Assad government, you know, despite its brutality. So how does the Chinese media present this conflict? Uh, there are Kurds who are fighting against the Assad government, 
and the Chinese government refuses to either criticize the Assad government or the Turkish government or the Iraqi government. Uh, it's an interesting situation. And I'm very curious, how does the Chinese media present the Kurds? Who are they? Are they just a people and they are, that's it? Or are they presented as a national movement, national liberation movement? Um, I'm very curious to find out. That's my first question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kia. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, for China, uh, our foreign policies always very care about, uh, you know, um, the business and uh, good relations with the sovereign states. And uh, for China, I think uh, in the Middle East, uh, uh, safety and uh, stability is uh, uh, is the most important uh, most important things. And uh, uh, in our media, uh, we also uh, you know uh, in China we uh, one of our principle of foreign policy is uh, non uh, uh, inferring. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, interference of other countries' internal affairs. Right. Um, so uh, in our media, we report, when we report the issues of uh, the, uh, the Middle East uh, include um, their, the, Kurds, uh, the, the Kurdish issue, we also just report the fact what, uh, uh, what was happening there and uh, normal uh, comments. And uh, we, uh, uh, our, chi our uh, Chinese government, uh, we just want to do business with these countries. And uh, we, uh, we're seeking, uh, we, are, uh, we are seeking the opportunities uh, to, to make money there. And we want to cooperate with, with any countries uh, there. So mm, we, didn't uh, comment uh, the Kurdish issue too much, especially you know China <coughs> uh, uh, China uh, opposes uh, any uh, uh, you know the uh, separatism uh, because China also have the same questions in Xinjiang, uh, so we don't comment too much. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. So I mean, promoting Kurdish separatism might be equated then with uh, separatism in China's northwestern province, Xinjiang, which uh, would be a bit of um, um, disturbing comparison. Uh, the second thing, I, I apologize, but what I am getting from all three presentations is that China sells much more than it receives from the Arab world. I still don't know what Egypt exports to China. I know what China <laughs> exports to Egypt. It seems like tr trucks and trains and ships are basically overwhelming the Egyptian market with Chinese made goods. But there is not much going from Egypt to China. And that strikes me as less of an economic issue than buying political influence and making Egypt or other Arab countries more dependent on China. Is that my, is my reading correct or am I just completely missing it? June. <laughs> if, if you don't feel comfortable answering that, I understand you. <laughs> um, as we know, uh, Zoo the transportation in Egypt is uh, uh, in backwardness. Uh, China, China give uh, give aid to Egyptian uh, Egypt uh, on technical uh, technical technology on uh, on train, especially high tech uh, train. I think uh, 
uh, Chinese government uh, want to help uh, Egyptian development. And uh, if uh, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt has uh, uh, developed well, I think uh, more peace will uh, get uh, in the country. <laughs> A very diplomatic answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have a one comment. Well, nowadays well, we have a one belt, one road, right? Initiative and try to build all kinds of uh, seaports, uh, railways, uh, airports. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kier mentioned that the transportation, normally it's a one way. So the train is going westward, full loaded, coming back empty. Uh, as we see the empty, uh, oh, yeah, I think here, well, it's a uh, one way. Okay. And then, well, actually, Professor uh, Zhao mentioned that we never expect the trade will be a balanced one, as uh, 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 Daisha mentioned about well, whether China is going to see in the new future the balanced the, the trade. Well, we uh, privately people will, will ask each other, and then if you ask or openly, or even if in a, on occasions like this at the university, you will be invited out for tea <laughs> by com by Chinese government officials or their counterpart of FBI or CIA agents. Yeah, yeah, they say, "Hey, Professor Kia, we would like to have a tea with you. <laughs> yeah, come with come with us." And what they will say is, uh, "Could you be?" Silent on this, yeah. Okay. How how open is the media? We um, some years ago we hosted a, a a student from China who was attending university and he stayed at our place and and um, he was telling us how onerous, how difficult it was to utilize the internet freely. Uh, and substantially, uh, it seemed like there was some control and and uh, resistance in allowing transparency or certain media companies to operate over the internet there so he was he was very joyful to be in our country and to f have total access you know as freely as he could. He also downloaded several Chinese programs on computers that freely <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, but but receiving but communicating with him now it, it seems like our messages are they're not edited but they're rarer than they normally have been it seems like some messages get through and some don't and I don't think it's an internet connection issue can you comment on on the freedom of gosh speech media, um, um, I, we heard that uh, on the Kurdish and the, the media will, will the, the news gives the scenes but n no commentary is given. So in the media that you're talking about, are, is there a, any freer exchange or many, any more openness in the communication flow than say five years ago? Has that changed at all? Uh, you mean the uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, internet? Uh, I think there are two dimensions. Two dimensions. One dimension is maybe in uh, in the China uh, domestic. The other is the uh, foreign dimensions. But I'm, I'm expert in uh, in uh, in uh, um, maybe in foreign relations. But I think uh, 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 China and Arabic countries they promote uh, more uh, <coughs> media exchange. Uh, frequently, uh, their uh, personal exchange, uh, uh, their delegation from its country, its country uh, visit in China, and uh, Chinese uh, media uh, person visit uh, uh, media countries, and we set a lot of br branches in uh, um, 
Middle East countries and the Middle East countries also said a branch in China. But also, I think uh, you mean mentioned the some some uh, uh, social media, Twitter, something. Uh, I think it is ob obstacle to for for, uh, for China, uh, China and every uh, country to communicate communicate. But I think in the future will be better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I not so much social media, but just. Um, access to internet sites that are informational and political or financial or just factual, uh, even academic, uh, access to s any sites freely in China as it is here in the United States. I is, that, is that becoming more viable? Is that becoming more, more um, possible? Or is the media fairly, the internet and what can be accessed fairly controlled in China still? You mean the media, uh, internet, uh, maybe some information, can access to some uh, uh, specific uh, website or something? No, sub subject matter that is, that is factual, substantial, pub political, financial, that, you know, that is, uh, it isn't, um, um, it isn't personalized to a country or another. It's just it's just like reporting on on the Syria situation, for example, and and the Assad government. But no comment is given. Pictures are shown. No comment is given. I see that as rather restrictive and not as transparent as censored. might be here. Yeah, it's censored. Yeah. Censored? You mean yeah. there are some uh, some something about Syria something? S well. No, generally speaking, um, maybe in politically sensitive areas, the subject maybe, yeah, matter yeah, yeah. is censored. Yeah, I think uh, in every area, uh, every country, or maybe similar, there are some maybe some sensitive uh, information. Maybe some maybe it will be uh, controlled. Maybe it, I think it will be some some information will be uh, uh, harm to the national security. Something so. Maybe uh, it's, I think uh, countries will, uh, will be take some measure to control something. I think this is the, uh, I think uh, it is uh, natural for, I think it, uh, 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 if they think they will be be do good to their national security something. I just wanted to comment. I mean, this morning we had a wonderful presentation by Dexter Roberts, uh, who was the uh, Bloomberg uh, correspondent. And, and the f one of the first thing uh, Dexter said is that uh, the Chinese banks are fully controlled by the state, right? That by itself should answer your question. Uh, if investment is completely controlled by the state, media outlets are functions of the state, right? I mean, let's put aside the PC discourse. I mean, when you do not have a financial base to have your own independent media, you cannot have a free media. Is that, is that jumping the gun or? Okay, I think we answered. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me uh, make a few comments on, on this. Uh, they cannot make comments, I can. Because it's sensitive, well, the, as they mentioned, it's a sensitive. Okay, it's a sensitive issues over there, and they don't want to talk about this. Well, actually, they have to be careful talking about this. As I said, that were well, on occasions like this over there in China, where well, professors had to be careful, and uh, quite a few of them lost their jobs, or even yeah, they lost their freedom because of uh, the fact that they don't watch out their mouths. But here, it's OK. So I will make a few comments. I don't think I will get into trouble. Well, anyway, so the internet over there in China, well, with that, you cannot access Google. Google is banned. You cannot have access to Google. And then some people use uh, VP, VPN, VPNS, right, and try to climb over the wall. That's what they say, climb over the wall so that can, they can have access 
to some of the sites which are not available in China to get over the wall so they can do that. And now well, the government, uh, they try to uh, have a control over that too to see who is using this. And uh, they will talk to you if they find that you frequently use this for what purpose. Okay. And uh, so there is no total freedom in uh, internet access over there. And, uh, uh, and that's what happens over there. And now let me talk about media, mass media, how it works. Okay, normally every week, well, there is a department which is called, they use that word, it's a positive word. And here it's a negative word, but over there it's a positive word. It's a propaganda government, uh, department, propaganda department. And propaganda here is a, like a negative, but over there it's a positive. So there is a, a called Central Propaganda Department under the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. So every week they will issue, uh, what do you call that? Yeah, that say, well, what you can talk, what you cannot talk, and for what you should be silent about this, and then for what and you can talk and report and they discuss, and there is a guideline for you. You have to use that guideline to report this issue or that kind of issue. Or there are some uh, situations over there in America, like uh, the travel ban. We call it travel ban. Uh, Donald Trump called it. It's an it's a, a administrative order on delayed entry into the United States. And here the mass media used the word uh, travel ban. And then in China, the propaganda, they propose a word, a phrase that they use. Uh, their use, not travel ban. Their use is a uh, Islamic ban, right? So they went one further step to call it Islamic ban. And here we say travel ban. And uh, Donald Trump says delayed entry into the United States of America until we have a measure to check their background. And that's what it is. And the mass media use travel ban over there. That propaganda department issued a guideline to say, we need to use this phrase. And everybody has to use that phrase. And if you use a different phrase, you use a Donald Trump's phrase, and you will get into trouble. And, and that's what happens. And then. Normally, weekly, they have uh, issues, uh, send out issues to all mass media, newspapers, radios, okay, and then they will close you if you make well, too many violations or you make well, big errors to openly uh, report what are not supposed to report or using the wrong guidelines, not following the guidelines. Okay, you don't have to make a comment. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so going kind of off of all of that, um, CISU has an official Facebook page, but when I was in uh, Shanghai, there was, you weren't allowed to go on Facebook. Is that recently changed, or is that a new, like, only certain institutions can have Facebook? Facebook. Professor Chen. Mm. You mean there are, CISU, our university have a Facebook? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, our university now uh, uh, more focused on uh, international images of university. We uh, our website have a lot of language. We uh, translate into Arabic language, Turkish language, uh, Japanese language. Uh, so um, we are maybe make our university more internationalized. So we uh, have our Facebook. Uh, uh, can't uh, so so make our <laughs> university uh, well known to others. Thank you. Well, I think well, her question is: uh, Is that Facebook account still active? I think in China, you know, uh, Facebook, <laughs> Twitter. Uh, 
the 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 of official made Facebook is is uh, okay, yeah. but uh, the private uh, maybe it doesn't work. The, the official have a Facebook, maybe they are they can can use it, they can uh, work, but uh, in private uh, you can't access Twitter, Facebook you can't can't uh, access. Personal personal user uh, will be banned, but uh, official user, just like uh, the central government, a uh, department of central government can use uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, uh, that's okay. But a uh, personal user <laughs> is always uh, uh, banned. If you use uh, v VP, uh, VPN, VMP or v VPN, VPN, if you use uh, uh, domestic uh, account, uh, you will be traced. You will be checked. And uh, a lot of people uh, use uh, foreign uh, account uh, to buy uh, VPN, uh, they will use it, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Um, so this question might, this might be more of a question for you, but I'm not sure here, so we'll see. Um, so how much uh, choice do professors uh, from China visiting America have as to the content and subjects they can teach? And how much choice do students coming from China have as to what kind of courses they can take? Yeah, let me pick up the second question first. Well, we have lots of uh, exchange students and uh, they are so happy and excited when they come here to see the variety of uh, courses that they can take. Well, let's say they major in English, where well, they can even take a class in a media class, performing. And does that happen over there in China? No. Well, if you major in English, you can only take well, certain elective courses, but you cannot take well, courses which seem to be far-fetched, has very little to do with your major. But here, it's a different. So we have a CISU students, exchange students. As a matter of fact, we have a two on campus right now. And they, both, they are both English majors. And you know what happened? They are not taking any English classes here. <laughs> yeah, they just take the advantage of uh, being here, taking all kinds of very interesting classes that they believe that it's going to be wonderful for their career later on. So one is taking a uh, drama. And, and one is taking a media class. And so they can, they feel free to uh, take whatever classes they do. And uh, for visiting scholars, I would like to have a uh, Professor Zhao talk about this because he is, uh, well, he was a visiting scholar a year ago. Please. Oh, you saw, uh, uh, as I know, uh, there's no uh, limitation for our visiting scholar uh, to speak. And uh, uh, including me, I, I attend, uh, I have uh, uh, I, I attended uh, a lot of conferences uh, and uh, a lot of uh, public activities uh, and uh, um, make friends uh, uh, with all kinds of uh, uh, people here and we talk about uh, extensive uh, topics uh, that, 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 that no uh, limitation. There no limitation. But uh, <laughs> um, I must point it, point it out that uh, uh, some some uh, some uh, some my students uh, some of my students uh, my friends uh, ask uh, uh, sensitive uh, problems uh, about China. I will say sorry, no comment, <laughs> because I am a member of Communist Party. <laughs> 
I will keep it a secret of our party. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Okay, and then I heard, I have heard from uh, some of the uh, visiting professors who were actually, well, well there's no guidelines. Well, actually, probably there, sh there, there is a guideline. But when you are here, well, actually, well, pretty much you are on your own. But that cautiousness, yeah, because well, they were born and grew up in that culture. So that cautiousness has become one of their genes. It's uh, in there. It's a part of uh, themselves, and they just can't live without that. So they are very, very cautious and uh, careful. Well, sometimes we'll have a uh, lunch, brown bag lunch discussions, forums. And uh, if uh, that particular forum is about sensitive issue like Xinjiang or Tibet, uh, they try to avoid. And they say, why, why avoid? Just go and uh, sit there and listen. And then they say, oh, that's sensitive. And once in a while, you know, I'm a Chinese, and maybe they will ask me. And then I will be in a very bad situation, whether I should talk or I should not talk. He said, that, that's bad. And I say, well, just go there and listen to other people, well, what they think about this. You know, we need to be open, and we need to know other people's opinion. Just don't hide inside yourself. But some people will go out and uh, hear all different uh, uh, talks, and then some people are just too cautious to just to participate. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here, and uh, that will conclude the 17th annual conference. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Well, Kia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll have the same conference next year, and uh, watch out for the dates. And uh, from time uh, to time, uh, the center will uh, uh, hosting lots of uh, other lectures. And uh, you're welcome to attend yeah, the Brown Bag uh, lunch uh, talks. Well, thank you again, and have a wonderful uh, weekend. Uh, hope you have a very good trip back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.